Jimmy's got the talk title of his integrated health and wellbeing, which is a key and deep and long-standing passion for myself. Um, I'll just cover a little bit of an introduction for my background for anyone who missed the session this morning. Um, I left Year 12 and went straight into Defence Force Academy for the first intake where they combined Army, Navy and Air Force officers. Um, by the time I was 21, I'd shared beers with, with seven individuals who had taken their own life, you know, mostly the Vietnam vets, people who just couldn't handle the nightmares of, of what they'd lived with. Um, so I was at, at the top level of human organisation and design, you know, groups of people who could put together an F-18. So the year I was in, we bought 75 F-18s at 50 something million dollars a pop. I remember I've still got the paperweight, one of the fins off the turbojets, which is worth $18,000 for one little bit of supercast titanium. They cost $18,000 an hour to keep in the air. And I just, I, I remember just constantly being in awe of what we are capable of doing collectively and in, in shock and horror about what we're actually doing with that direction. You know, um, so I left, I left the military after three years and I went back to uni as a, as a senior, as a, as a senior student, um, and bogged down and studied psychology and religious studies. Um, so that became the start of what I still continue to explore now. So from that perspective, I'd like to introduce myself with a few biases, just so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, we know that people's background and habits and history affect the way they think and the way they see the world. So I think it's important to be aware of that and be aware of your biases. Um, I've been on a committed plant-based based diet since the first person I knew took their own life. I've just had big issues with what violence is and what human nature is. So I've been on a 100% plant-based diet since I was about 19. Now you see I'm not calling myself a vegetarian or a vegan. These sorts of words create division. Um, I'm a human who can choose to the degree that, that my outer environment provides me freedom, what I want to do. And I think if we identify with being humans who have an intelligent capacity to communicate and make choices, we can then have the debate over well, what's informing your choices. Where when we identify with labels, we tend to be part of a process of division. You, know, you see it in religious groups that there's so much killing in the name of peace and love that it's, it's beyond comical. So I, I'm not an alarmist, I'm not an environmental alarmist. You know, um, I tend to smile at the statistics that says that life on this planet is, in, is not in jeopardy. You know, we are not life on this planet. Do you hear what I said? Like, human life is. Okay. Yes, yes. Human life is. We are no greater or less than the cockroaches or the dinosaurs that have come and gone. Dinosaurs have come and gone. Cockroaches will thrive if we create a nuclear nest for them. Um, so I tend to be very informed by yoga philosophy in my life in terms of developing a worldview. Um, I like the Vedic culture and the concept that, that we are spirit and sitting here amongst us now I'd like to believe that we're all spirit having a human experience. And the Vedic philosophy talks about how there's biodiversity or division amongst unity. You know, and the best analogy I've ever heard for that is a tree. You know, all the leaves on the tree are unique. They are all burnt, born in a position in space and time from the tree. They are nourished by the tree. Ideally, they get to a point of maturity where they can give back to the tree. And they will pass. They will pass in the physical form. A life well lived for a leaf is a leaf that's contributed to the growth of the tree. Does, does this make sense? Even as the leaf falls from the tree, even the mass of that leaf becomes mulch, becomes, becomes breaks down and returns to the flesh of the tree. As a, as a tree willingly drops a leaf, now even in dry weather like this when trees are losing leaves, they're often willingly dropping the leaves because they, they, they don't have the water to photosynthesize, so they drop some of their leaves and use the body of that leaf as a mulch on the ground to keep the water in the, to help the greater tree survive. Um, so that tends to be how I see myself. I'm someone that, that uh, is very interested in has anyone heard that the dichotomy mentioned that, that the animal angel nature? Okay, I'll just speak to that for a second. So in psychology we talk about the three brains. Is anyone familiar with this concept? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, so we're going back to about the 60s now, or even earlier with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The three brain theory is an approach that says that we all have a limbic brain. 
Okay, we are, an, we, are, we are the human animal, and at a core level, we have an interest in survival. Okay, so that basically means feed, you know, fight for your food. If you can't fight for your food, flee, live to flight another day. So feed, feed, flee, fight, and there's another F in there which can be interpreted as reproduce. And, and then if we are in a state of emotional disturbance, we tend to operate in our limbic brain. You know, the, the, the devotees, the Hare Krishna say that a person's not interested in salvation while they're hungry. So this is one of the reasons they have, which um, Phil, who's the farm manager at Nusa Forest Retreat, and I just actually spent a couple of days at a Hare Krishna farm, and they, he found in their Bibles, they actually have a philosophy that no one within 10K should go hungry. Um, and we sat and witnessed the neighbours who have figured that out, literally rocking up at every meal and eating. Um, and when I asked them why they were there, their response was, it's such a beautiful vibe, we can't not be here. I sit in my house eating and I feel lonely, and I know there's all these people next door. I go there, they feed me, I can't believe it. Very, very interesting experience. Um, so this idea that we have a limbic brain that wants to survive, and if we can get our survival needs satisfied, and I look at this, my dad was a mountaineer, I look at this as setting up base camp. Now if you want to climb up to, to the peak of Everest in, in days gone by, you'd go up and down the mountain setting up various camps. You'd set up, carry all your gear to base camp, you'd rest for a few days, you'd carry some of that gear up to another camp and set up some food and some oxygen, you'd come down and rest, you'd go up to the second camp, up to a third camp and set up another base camp, you'd come back down to the bottom and eat and rest, and then you do an assault on the summit very quickly and very lightweight because you can stock up on supplies at each level. Um, so this, this is how I see the nature of, of what we are as humanity. We have our survival needs that need to be met and it pays in your business dealings, in your romantic dealings to evaluate where someone else is at in space and time because it's the same thing. They're not going to be interested in sustainable living while they're hungry while they're emotionally disturbed, you know, while they're angry, while they're frustrated, while, while they're in their emotions. So we also have an angel nature, an animal and an angel nature. So we are, does anyone see the old CCs at? Just say, just CCs, just say CCs. But it's always stuck in my mind and I like it because the Vedic definition of a healthy human being is, for a start, it's someone who is in the process of being, not doing. Now, and there's a whole lot of talk about this. You can define being as someone who is, is calm, centered, creative in a contributing way, but creative to the whole, not just for their own needs, and, and celebrating this. So there's a whole pack of C's which talks about what a good life is in transition. Being centered, calm, contributing, connected, and creative, right? So a whole, whole group of C's. And this is our angel nature. When we get to this point, Maslow talked about it as, as the peak of the pyramid of human needs. When we get our survival needs satisfied, we have the, we sometimes get the opportunity to, to start to explore and live from our divine nature, which is where we most can be pierced the moment. You know, has anyone seen the presentation here on the overview effect? Yes. Okay, the overview effect. So the overview effect is a a name for a recent phenomenon which astronauts have. Yeah. When they, when they go to space and they look back at the Earth. And overwhelmingly there's this description about even the ones who go up in recent time. I've seen 100 photos of the Earth, but when I look back, when I'm physically in space and I look back and see the Earth as a limited size in space, and I look back at the rest of the universe, something within them changes. They, 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 they see the beauty of it is one of the first things that, are, that strikes them, the, the dynamic movement. You, you can see there's a lot of beautiful, beautiful footage on YouTube about this where you see lightning storms as like a firework show. But there's something, we, we've now got a name for it, it's called the overview effect. And we believe that there's literally a neurological change that comes in a person from this very recent change in perspective that space travel gives us. The same concepts of this massive neurological change have been around for thousands of years in our ancient religious traditions. You know, and these states of consciousness where you start to identify with the bigger picture um, is often known as the integrated view or the or enlightenment or a satori moment. Does, does these, these words make sense? Okay, so nearly every culture has a word that talks about the little eye becoming the capital eye, that the, 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 the ego becoming 
united with all that, all that is. You know, the, the leaf starting to identify with the whole tree and not just itself. You know, in, in our supposed Christian tradition, we talk about you know, I and my father being one. You know, the little I is the leaf, our father is the tree. When we drop our biography and our history, we identify with the tree, and caring for the tree becomes as important as caring for our own body. Does this make sense? Okay, from, from, a, from a greater perspective. So, what are we? Who are we? You know, this, this concept of having an animal nature and an angel nature, and finding moments of calmness and emotional well-being is so important particularly when we're making our decisions. If we make a decision from a point of anger or frustration, if we make a decision after we've come out of a fight, we're going to make a survival-based decision, which is completely healthy and completely natural, but it's not going to be logical and it's not going to be rational. And so many businesses, so many families, so many endeavours come unstuck because people make decisions from that moment of fight or flight. Does this make sense? The moment of fight or flight is, is no longer scaring off a saber-toothed tiger. You know, it may be a two-year drawn-out court battle or a tax investigation or something that stays with you day in, day out, and it, it can be really hard to get people out of that emotional situation. This is what we spend 80% of our time doing at Beach Health Retreat. It's just helping people calm down, helping people relax, helping people clear the windows of perception for a couple of minutes so they can get an appreciation of who they are and what they really want in life. So if we are if we are all actually connected, and if it's in our angel nature to contribute, you know what Jimmy's done today and tomorrow, putting on an endeavour like this at a lot of his own personal expense and time. If if we want to do this, how do we get to this stage, and what's involved? So I'll come back to the assault on Everest. I think while we are operating from fear or anger or frustration or a sense of lack or any of these alarmist sort of issues, we tend to get caught up making Taj Mahal's at base camp. Does this make sense? You know, we get to the point where we've created such a material trap for ourselves at base camp that our lives become maintaining and protecting it. You know, often from our own loved ones when the divorce settlement goes through. You know, which, which. We laugh at that, and that's that's how you can, we can't take any of it with us. You know, two thirds of our brothers and sisters still live on a couple of dollars a day, while in the Western world we, we bury truckloads of food so that we can control the economic price. This, I, I'm not an alarmist. Again, there, there is there's no population issue on Earth. That is another thing we are told to keep ourselves fearful and not wanting to talk to our neighbours. You know, going to council to make our neighbour actually pay for half the fence we want, which is your legal right in suburbia to force your neighbour to fence yourself off from them. Um, you know, it, 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 the initial figures are with the current state of agriculture that we have on the planet, we can support 20 billion people. You know, there's no population problem. There, there is challenges and issues with distribution, you know, and, and with how we do agriculture. We can, we can increase how we do agriculture massively. Um, one of my extended family, one of my community members, Phil Stringer, has just picked this out of one of the gardens on the way here today, just to sort of give you guys a chance to see the food that's just coming out of our property in one of the driest summers we've ever had. You know, this is all non-commercial food. 90% of this sort of food we'll eat ourselves, and it's literally food meters food. But more importantly than that, it's fresh, it's in season, and it's organic. You know, it's full of what they were calling in the yoga or the Vedic texts, it's full of prana. So you eat food from your environment that is healthy and in season, and it's one of the single best things that you can do to help strengthen your immune system and help create resilient energy so that you're calm and balanced. The second, the second biggest thing that I believe you can do, and this is from 20 years working as a health practitioner, is work on your emotional well-being. You know, meditate daily. Is everyone okay if I just give a five minute example of how easy this is? Okay. So what I'd like you all to do is just try and sit with a straight back. The most important thing for any meditative practice is to try and align the spine and elongate it. You see on the Simpsons, the, the, the cartoons, the Indians are, do a head wobble as a head of a you know, So this, this is, we joke about it in the culture, but the reason is this is culturally they have a high value on having a, a, a loose spine. 
all the, all the information from the brain going through the body travels down that spine and all the sensory input from the body coming back to the brain travels back up that spine. So having a straight loose spine is, is the most important thing. If you're ever doing this instruction or this course with a friend, if someone is not comfortable sitting, get them to lie down. You, know, you, you don't have to sit in lotus pose to do this, but have a straight spine is number one. A good visualisation is, is imagine someone grabbing a tuft of hair and just, just try and elongate just let the vertebrae extend a little bit. And then close your eyes or semi-close the eyes if you've, if you've got any fear that I may come up and surprise you. You may want to keep your eyes half closed. It's wise to keep an eye out for the predator. Don't ever be gullible. The predator is always there and we should be thankful for this. The predator keeps us on our toes and growing. Whether that predator's corporate or, or that frustrated neighbour who's upset you didn't pay for half the fence or knocked it down. So become aware of the weight of the body. Just become aware of this vehicle that you sit within, that, that's travelling you through, taking you through this life. Feel the bum cheeks on the chair, how your feet are contacting the earth. Just give appreciation for the fact that you have this body, this vehicle that's here and now. I'm just going to introduce the concept that what's going on in the little toe of one of your feet is more complex than most thoughts you'll ever have in your entire life. Just, just give a sense of awe and mystery and gratitude and appreciation for your body. Just get a sense that if you were to relax your will, if you were to suspend your intelligence completely, you would collapse to the ground right now. Why is it you're able to sit up with a straight back? Why is it you're able to listen? Within this body, you have a will. You have something that's able to make a choice. So with that will, again, I'd like you to lift up through the head. Okay, syntropy. So the law of syntropy is, is, is about developing energy and organisation. If we were just flesh, we, were, we would succumb to the law of entropy. We would break down and decay, which is the destiny of all physical things. It's the destiny of our body. But within that body, there's an intelligence, there's a presence that can seek information and make choices on that information. And just with that, with that will, lift up through the spine. So we have a force pulling the body down, the forces of entropy and gravity in the physical world, and we have a, some sort of intelligence that can perceive and process information within. These are like the two forces on a guitar string. Is stress good or bad? Both, that's the answer we want. So too much stress, what happens to the guitar string? Twang. Not enough stress and we have no music, okay? So again, it's not, don't get caught up to the dualities. You know, we, we, we have a world of duality, male and female, happy and sad, you know, rich and poor, teacher and student, birth and death. You know, th through, the, through the play of those dualities, we have the unity of this intelligent presence that we can contact very quickly. So just become aware between those two forces, become aware of your breath and your heartbeat, the music of your life, you know, given to you from your parents, and to your parents from their parents. So there's a continual connection. But this, this presence, this life, right back to the dinosaurs, through all beings. With every breath you're interacting with the trees. It's said that once a group of people are in a room for more than three minutes, they've already exchanged atoms through their breath. So you're actually exchanging each other's bodies right now. And I'd just like you to think back. Just ask, ask of that deeper intelligence to give you a vision of who you really are. A time in your life when you've been most connected, most creative, doing something that you would celebrate. And it doesn't matter what comes to mind, but just ask of that intelligence to give you a vision. And I want you to see it in time and space. I want you to think about who was there, where were you? Were you inside or outside? How old were you? What, what are some of the people that were around you? If there was people around you, what were the elements around you? What were the qualities of these elements? Was there heat? Was there cool? Was it sharp and focused or relaxed and laid back? Just get a sense for how you feel. Get a, for that feeling of presence, of connection, of any creativity going on, of contribution. I'd just like you to slowly just give thanks for that little image and just start to pull back from it. Just start all your toes and fingers and start to open your eyes.
So if I may just sit here and just, just do that little two minute meditation. That's all meditation is. Meditation is just calming down. When we calm down and get centered, our energy leaves the limbic brain and goes into our outer cortex, which is where we're truly human. Okay, Gandhi made a great statement that, that we're all born with the ferocity of a lion, the venom of a snake, the cunning of a fox, you know, the strength of a bull. We've all got this. We have the capacity for humanity. The capacity, but it takes cultivating. I'd like to suggest that this concept of finding that balanced spot where there's no emotions, where you're inspired, in spirit, you know, where you're identifying with humanity and, and beyond that life on this planet, not with your own flesh and blood, is, is the best place to make decisions from. And from this, from this point, which it's so easy to do, it's so easy to do, but many, many people are fooled because we're conditioned to think things have to be complex. Investing has to be complex. I need a stockbroker. You know, it's a dangerous world out there. You know, the, the biggest danger is to pass your life and not know yourself as tree, not know yourself as ecology, not know yourself as brother and sister. So what I'd like to invite you here to do, I've got a few minutes left and then we'll have some questions, is just bring out any tradition, religious tradition or, or ancient tradition, their instruction for how to meditate or how to find peace. Real, read it, realise that it's very simple. You can just go sit on the beach, sit on your bed before you wake up or when you go to bed. Find a moment of calm. What I did is a shortcut by getting you to remember a time when you were calm. It just activates a certain part of the brain, so it's a bit of a trick to, to fast track you to a certain way of being. This is why a lot of people do what they do. This is why a lot of people do adrenaline sports, whether it's parachuting or racing fast cars. It's why a lot of people gamble their lives away because it, it, allows, it takes them to a spot where they're in the moment. You know, you don't need those outer expensive or dangerous things to do it. You know, this is what the meditative traditions teach us. Step two, after doing that regular calm, is to, you know, Einstein said the quality of your life is based on the quality of your decisions, your questions. Your decisions can only follow the questions you allow yourself to ask. So ask yourself questions like, as my true self, what do I really need? You know, what is the summit of my life? In the movie of my life that is passing with every breath as we sit here, what would I like to achieve? You know, what does the, my angel self really want to do on this planet? Because when you find that dance, when you find that way of interacting with the world, do you think your problems go away? Do you think it gets easy? No, it gets harder. But there's a fundamental shift in the way you show up in the world. Instead of running through the forest from the saber-toothed tiger and getting increasingly frustrated every time you trip over a vine or, or stub your toe or hurt your shin because the tiger's catching up, the forest stays the same. You're still going to trip, you're still going to fall, you're still going to have ignorances. But the shift is running, is now it's like running towards your beloved instead of running from the tiger. Does this make sense? So if you're dancing your dance, every step you take, despite the frustrations, is a great step. There's something to learn, there's something to appreciate, there's some growth to be had. Okay? Um, so, with questions like, what do I need to live? You know, I'd like to suggest that answers that should come to you very quickly is good, clean food. If anyone would like to come and, when the talk finishes, and take a banana or take some kale, um, the Hare Krishnas call this prasadam. Right? So, so their word for that is food that is made for human nourishment, not for profit. We have reduced food to a commercial entity, which does, which um, fills, fills involved in food sovereignty alliance. That as soon as you make food a commercial item, you cut farm. You, you, you need cat farmers. You know, if they've got to make a profit with what they do, it makes them very hard to make the highest quality food because they've got to make a profit. They've got to keep the mortgage paid. You know, it, it, one of the biggest unreported national disasters in this planet is, is a lot of, on this country even, is that a lot of our best farmers are killing themselves. Especially now when Australia is in the midst of one of the worst droughts we've ever had. Not the longest drought, but some of the hottest weather without rain that we've ever had. And if it continues, then there will be a lot more loss to the real wealth of the, of the living libraries of multi-generational family farmers, which, which are going under. 
So I'd like to suggest that, that some of the things that we could agree on with a little bit of contemplation is that we want high quality in season nourishing food so that we have a, a nourished vital body. But then beyond that, the, the body is just a vehicle. We want our cars serviced and washed. Yeah, we want it looking nice, we want it running well. But the, the vehicle is just to do, it's just to allow you to do something. You, sh you sh don't get caught up building a Taj Mahal at base camp. What, what's, the, what's the goal of your life? What's going to really get your juices flowing? What's the fight that you want to take on? Because there will always be a fight. You won't get away from the predator. But pick, pick the predator you want to dance with. If, 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 if your summit is to get an ultimate spiritual insight, you know, if you want to be the designer of that motor car, you don't need to be a designer to drive it. But that's, that's a summit you can perceive. And one of the insights you start to get is the predator and prey are the same thing. They need each other. The cop needs the robber. You know, or he's unemployed. Right. Um, you know, the, the doctor needs the sick person, the teacher needs the student. You know, to have a life, we need death. Or we would have a population problem real quick. Okay, is, is, is there any questions on, on any of this? Is there any specific questions on... So my, my key point is, is to get to know yourself and make your decisions and ask your questions from a calm, centred state so that you're making decisions from the angel place of who you are, not the animal. Does this make sense? Before you go see your lawyer, especially, before you go see your doctor, especially, you're not just a body or a bank account. Um, and a lot of these professions, it's in their vested interest to have you see yourself like this, yeah? Okay? Well, in terms of the three-legged stool, body, very important. We have a body, we, we've got nothing. We, we, we're a ghost at best. But the body, the mind, and the soul, from a Vedic perspective, the orders of importance for your health and well-being are your soul, number one. How are you showing up in the world? What are you connecting to? What are you contributing to? Number one. There's been many a study done that if a people, person loves who they are and they love who they hang out with and they love what they do, they can have a crap diet, they can smoke cigarettes all day, drink beer with the best of them, and live a long, healthy life. If you don't like who you are and don't like what you do, you, you can have the best organic diet on the planet and get cancer in your 30s. Okay, we are not just a body. And from the Vedic perspective, the light that animates the body and letting that shine is, is the priority. You know, it's not in the vested interest of a culture that has economic profit as its number one goal to, to, let us, to educate us about that or let us see that. The second thing is your mind, how you think, what you focus on. Your mind's a tool. If you get the first thing right, your mind becomes in your spirit, how, how, who you are. Your mind becomes in service of that and it becomes an amazing tool. If you're not a calm person, if you don't have an understanding of who you are, your mind gets caught up with bickering and attacking. It gets caught up servicing the animal nature. If you're lucky, attacking your neighbour. I do it all the time. If you're not, attacking yourself. Right? Which is what I see the fallout in at work. I see a lot of people who just do not like themselves. When it gets down to it, they don't like themselves. They don't feel comfortable in their own skin. And just, just if you can get someone to meditate for five, ten minutes a day, and then ask at the end of that the question, what am I good at? What do I love in life? If you can get someone to do that for 30 days, it's amazing the difference that you can get in people's self-esteem. We've seen people on antidepressants for five, six years, and I say if, it's so hard to get people to do that. But those that do find that they can you know, drop diabetes meditation almost, almost within weeks. They can drop antidepressant meditation almost in weeks. Okay, this is very simple, but very, very powerful stuff. As soon as you have a, any sort of organisation become corporatised, definitely as soon as they become public, their legal, their legal goal is to make profit for their shareholders. You know, if they don't do that, they can actually be taken to the court. Taken to court. Um, profit is not actually often in the interest of health or wellbeing. The food industry is one of those. You know, we can do amazing soil tests and have there's all sorts of amazing systems. You know, we, we our, our property is a permaculture inspired property. There is, there's all sorts of things you can do with holistic planning and, and long-term thinking. The course that we just did was a syntropic course, you know, that which, which we're offering at Nusa Forest Retreat now as part of our, our permaculture course. We do an introduction to syntropic farming. Incredibly, incredible productive ways of getting incredible production from the landscape. There's nothing, very little written in English on in syntropic farming at the moment. 
it's one of the very promising ways that we can increase the nutrition and the quality and the health of our, our, our bodies, our families, our loved ones and our communities. The, the issue it always comes up against though is it's not that profitable. You know, we, a forest is 10 times more productive than the best agricultural systems on the planet. But you can't harvest everything from the forest by a machine, put it in a truck, take it to a central market in the city and then get it to a supermarket for you know, a dollar for a bag of tomatoes. Which, which what that's actually doing is justifying, in Sydney, the average house price has just hit $1.1 million. You know, which gives you the privilege of then paying $5,000 a year for rates, paying for your energy, paying for your water, paying for your communications. That's an average house. Who wants an average house? You know, who's going to feel a maul from their partner if they say, oh, you, we, you've, you've given me an average house, honey, I'm at your average. This is the game we get caught up in. You know, we, we want the Taj Mahal at base camp, and we forget that this is row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. This is, it's, all a, it's all a light show. D does this make sense? Yeah. The, 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 for all the supposed good work of the, of the anti-cancer societies of the world, incidents of cancer are going through the roof. And we're getting it younger and younger and younger. Um, look, follow the money, follow the money trail. You, know, you, you look into the supporters and funders of these programs, like the meat industry, the sugar industry, they're, they're supporters of the Anti Cancer Society, they're, they're supporters of the heart industries. Is meat good or bad? It depends on time, place, and circumstance. A lot of the supposed meat that we're buying from the supermarket is actually scientifically proven to be carcinogenic. Prep, especially a lot of the processed meats. You know, some of them are completely deficient in essential oils like omega-3. They're a long, long, it, it's, it's almost not the same product that what our ancestors used to eat. You know, hunted down or, or, or that's, that had a natural life, you know, eating real foods itself. In terms of population, if we have any population problem, we have a population problem with, it's not even just animals, it's the current agricultural practices for which we're bringing up animals. We can use animals to create habitat. We can use cows to create topsoil and pasture and start repossessing and re regreening deserts. We can literally do this. We don't. At the moment, we've got more and more animals getting brought up in feedlot situations, eating grain. The, the, the balance of the biochemistry of those cows just plummets. You know, they get very sick and die. They won't even live a healthy life. It doesn't matter because they're hit over the head and turned into our food for profit. It's not healthy food. It's, beyond, it's not just not healthy food, it's almost criminal food when the evidence is there that it's, it's, it, it undermines our health. The law of entropy is that things will decay and break down. This floorboard, as nice as it is and as well polished as it is, is this mic, they're, they're all operating under the law of entropy. It's as good as it's going to get right now. It's breaking down and decaying every day, it's simplifying, it's going back to base elements. So it's losing energy, it's losing organisation, it's losing structure. The law of centropy is what operates through life. This, this is alive. It's literally moving up against the force of gravity 